Good evening, children. Tonight's story is called Arthur and the King's Sword. Chapter 1. The Messenger Long ago, when Britain was in a dark age of war and famine, a young boy called Arthur lived far in the west with his father, Sir Ector, and his big brother, Kay. Sir Ector was a chieftain, and they had a fine castle, so they were safe, and they had plenty to eat. But Arthur knew that times were hard for others. Kay was nearly a man, uh, had his own war horse, weapons and armour. Arthur longed for the day when he too would be able to ride a war horse like Kay's and have a shield and a great sword at his side. Kay knew that and loved to tease his little brother and laugh at him. Then one cold and misty winter's morning a messenger rode in Sir, into Sir Ector's castle. He said there was to be a great meeting of Britain's warlords and chieftains and that Sir Ector was invited to come. Sir Ector said he would be there, so the messenger galloped off to spread his news elsewhere. I hope you'll be taking me with you, father, said an excited Kay. Yeah, of course, said Sir Ector. You'd better come too, Arthur. Arthur hadn't expected that, so he was surprised and very pleased. But why, father, huh? said Kay. He's a boy, and this is man's work. He'll be a man soon enough, Sir Ector said, glancing at Arthur, and this will help him learn what that means. Besides, you'll need a squire, Kay. As Kay's squire, Arthur would have to look after his brother's weapons and armour, but he didn't mind that, and Kay seemed to like the idea of being able to give his brother orders, so he didn't complain any more. A week later, Sir Ector rode off with Kay, Arthur, and a small band of warriors. The meeting was to be held in London, the old Roman capital on the opposite side of the country, and a long journey lay ahead of them. Chapter 2. The Great Uther Pendragon Arthur had never been away from home before. At first he was as excited as Kay, both of them eager to see new sights, but the further they travelled east, the worse things looked. They passed through burnt fields and villages and towns, and wherever they went, the people were hungry and scared. This is awful, father, Arthur said eventually. Kay was riding with the warriors, but Arthur was beside Sir Ector. Arthur was very upset by what he was seeing. It was like riding through some kind of terrible nightmare, he thought. I don't understand, he said. Why are things so bad everywhere? It started when the Romans left us to defend ourselves, Sir Ector said quietly, his face grim. The Saxons invaded and they've been spreading from the east like a plague ever since, killing our people and taking the land, and the warlords make it worse by squabbling and fighting with each other. Why don't they join together to fight the Saxons, said Arthur. Because none of them trust any of the others, said Sir Ector. And no one has been strong enough to make them listen to reason, not since the days of the last king, the great Uther Pendragon. But even he couldn't keep them under his control for long enough to sweep the Saxons from our shores. What happened to him, father? Arthur asked. Did he die in battle? No, Arthur, said Sir Ector quietly, turning towards him as he spoke. Arthur could see Sir Ector had a strange look on his face. It's thought that... Some of the warlords plotted against him, and that he was poisoned along with all his family. But nobody has ever really known the whole truth. They rode in silence after that, Arthur thinking deeply. He wished that he could do something to help, but what power did he have? He was only a boy, still too young to achieve anything in the hard world of men and war. So who has called this meeting, father? Arthur asked after a little while. I don't know, said Sir Ector, but I do know this might well be our last chance to save ourselves, although I doubt that the warlords will agree. Then Kay came riding up, and Arthur asked no more questions. Chapter 3. The Hooded Figure A few days later they arrived at the gates of London and entered the city, most of the old Roman buildings were ruined and the streets were crowded with hard, tough men, the warlords of Britain and their followers. Their eyes cold, their faces scarred from battle, distrust hung over the city like a fog. Wait here until we find out what's happening, Arthur, 
said Sir Ector. Then Sir Ector strode off with his warriors and Kay, leaving Arthur to guard the horses. Arthur noticed Kay's sword hanging from his saddle. Suddenly Arthur was distracted from his watching by the sound of loud, angry voices. He left the horses to see what was going on and a tall, dark figure in a hooded cloak brushed by him as he did so, seeming almost to glide over the cobbles like a ghost. Arthur stopped and shivered, the little hairs on the back of his neck standing on end as he watched the figure slip away. And then he shook his head to clear it and carried on in the same direction he'd been going before. Two warriors had been arguing, but by the time Arthur reached them, they had settled their differences and moved off. Arthur quickly returned to the horses, suddenly feeling worried. One look told him Kay's sword wasn't hanging from his saddle anymore. Just then, Kay himself appeared alone. Father sent me back for my sword. Where is it? I, I, don't, I don't know, Arthur said. I, I, think, I think it's been stolen. Well, it's your fault, Kay snarled at him. You're my squire and you were supposed to be looking after it. So you better find me another sword and be quick about it or I'll have to tell father just how useless you are. Arthur ran from his brother. Night was falling and Arthur wandered the gloomy ruined streets of London. Men were clustering for warmth now around their campfires. Arthur wondered how he could have been so stupid and where he could possibly find another sword to replace the one that he had lost. Then he bumped into that tall, dark, hooded figure for a second time. You might find what you seek in there, said the hooded man, and pointed beyond him. Arthur looked and saw a large pavilion in a nearby courtyard. When he turned round again, the hooded man had vanished into the darkness. It seemed even stranger than before, but though the hairs on the back of his neck stood up again, Arthur didn't stop to think about it. He slipped into the pavilion. It contained a block of stone surrounded by tall candles that cast a golden glow. There was some writing carved on the stone, which Arthur ignored. He was too busy looking at the sword sticking into it. Arthur grabbed the hilt and pulled, and the sword came out smoothly. A tingle shot up his arm, but Arthur ignored that too and went to find Kay. Now that's what I call a sword, said Kay, grabbing it without thanks. Arthur hadn't noticed quite how good a sword it was, with its jewelled pommel and its fine steel blade that seemed to catch the light at every turn. But when the boys found their father, Sir Ector noticed the sword immediately. That's not your sword, Kay. Sir Ector wanted to know what had happened to Kay's own sword and where he'd got the other. Kay blustered, claiming he'd swapped his old sword for the new one. Sir Ector obviously didn't believe a word of it, and Arthur finally told their father the truth. Take me to this stone, Arthur, said Sir Ector. I want to see it. Arthur did as he was ordered. Chapter 4. The Sword The three of them went through the dark streets to the courtyard, and the pavilion was the same as when Arthur had left it, the block of stone standing inside, the candle still burning, no one else there. But now Sir Ector stood in front of it and read the carved writing aloud. He who draws the sword from the stone is the true-born king of Britain. Arthur was lying, father, said Kay, quickly stepping forward. He didn't pull the sword from the stone. It was me, so I must be the, the, the true-born king of England. Well then, it should be easy for you to perform this miracle once more, my son, sir, said Sir Ector. Put the sword back in the stone and then pull it out. Kay placed the tip of the sword on the stone and it slid in up to the hilt with a clang. And then Kay pulled and nothing happened. He pulled till his face was red and he groaned but the sword wouldn't move. Then Sir Ector tried using all his strength and still the sword stayed stuck in the stone. Now you try Arthur, said Sir Ector at last. Arthur gripped the hilt in a daze, gave the gentlest of tugs, and the sword came out smoothly. Arthur felt that tingle in his arm again, but far more powerfully. He stared at the sword, spellbound by its beauty, and then he saw that his father and brother were kneeling before him, their heads bowed. But why, why are you kneeling before me? Arthur said. I, 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 I can't be king. Ah, but you can, Arthur said a loud voice. The proof is in your hand. 
You are the true-born son of a king, and you will be king of the Britons. Arthur looked round and saw that tall hooded figure for a third time. The man threw back his hood to reveal a face that was both old and young, his eyes a deep forest green, his white hair swept off his high, pale forehead. Merlin, said Hector, I should have known you were behind all this. Arthur had heard tales of the legendary Merlin, although still that moment he had never suspected the wizard might actually be real. Arthur, however, was more interested in what Merlin had said than in the wizard's fame. But Sir Ector is my father, Arthur said, and he isn't a king. I have always loved you as my son, Arthur, said Sir Ector, but you are not my blood. Your real father was the great Uther Pendragon himself. Arthur listened in utter amazement as Sir Ector told the story. Uther had known of the warlord's plot against him and had asked Merlin to save his baby son. So one dark, windswept night, Merlin had spirited Arthur away to Sir Ector's castle. Sir Ector had already agreed to bring up Arthur as his own son and had never told anyone that Uther Pendragon was Arthur's true father. I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Arthur said at last. He was deeply moved at the thought of what Sir Ector had done for him. And I swear that whatever happens in the future, I will always think of you as my father. And you, Kay, will always be my brother, if that is your wish too. Kay smiled at him and said it was, and the three of them joined hands. I've long kept watch over you, Arthur, said Merlin. And the time has come for you to take your rightful place. It was I who called the warlords and chieftains together so you could show yourself to them as their king. We need a leader, someone who can unite us against the Saxons once more. But I'm too young, said Arthur, self-doubt and fear suddenly filling his heart. Men like that will never accept me as their leader, will they? Merlin just smiled and told him to put the sword back in the stone. The next morning, Merlin summoned all the warlords and the chieftains to the courtyard. The pavilion had been taken down in the night, and the sword in the stone was there for all to see. An excited murmur ran through them as they read the writing. Arthur stood behind the crowd with Sir Ector and Kay. Behold the test of kingship, said Merlin. Each man shall try his hand. And one by one, the warlords and chieftains did try, but with no success. No matter how they strained, none could pull the sword from the stone. And then Merlin called for Arthur, and the youth stepped forward and slowly made his way through the crowd. The warlords and chieftains stared at him and muttered suspiciously. Arthur gripped the hilt, and they gasped as he pulled the sword free of the stone that tingled shooting up his arm again. Arthur raised the sword on high, but now the crowd was angry. It's a trick, somebody yelled. Kill that wizard and a boy. Several warriors drew their swords and advanced, and suddenly Arthur realised he was not afraid. He had been waiting for this moment his whole life. He knew what to do, and that he would also know what to do when it came to fighting the Saxons and saving his people from fear and hunger. Arthur leapt into action, his blade flashing in the morning sunlight as he parried the warrior's savage blows with unbelievable speed and skill, the clang of steel on steel filling the air. He fought like a man, like the king they needed to lead them, and soon he had those fierce warriors at his mercy. The tingle now filled him from head to foot. Power flashed from his eyes. Kneel to your King Britons, roared Merlin, and the whole crowd obeyed. The legend of King Arthur had begun. Well, that's the end of tonight's story, children. God bless, and I'll see you tomorrow.